Okay? So let's get started for the last lecture. Thank you. There are many excellent review articles on this subject. Here's a, a collection of uh, notes, actually a book now, that you might find useful. So let's just recall where we were at the end of my uh, previous lecture. So the kinematic data for n particle massless scattering is equivalent uh, to a collection of n ordered points in C3. And one way to think about this is as an n by 4 matrix, where you have n columns and 4 rows, and each column is the, uh, each column consists of the 4 component uh, homogeneous coordinate of some point in P3. Now while you can do this for any uh, massless quantum field theory, something very special happens in particular quantum field theories, in particular n equals 4 super Yang-Mills theory. Uh, there is a surprising symmetry called dual conformal invariance. And this amounts to a symmetry um, that acts on this matrix uh, via left multiplication by, uh, acts via left multiplication uh, by GL4. Uh, on, let me say, on the Z matrix. Okay. This is a highly non-trivial uh, non symmetry. When you work backwards, so, so what it means is that if you calculate a new scattering amplitude as a function of the kinematic data, it has to be invariant under multiplying this uh, n by 4 matrix by any uh, 4 by 4 GL uh, 4C matrix. When you translate back to ask what that implies in the other sets of variables that we've considered, it amounts to, uh, remember we defined these um, dual momenta that I called x, where pi was xi minus xi plus 1. Dual conformal transformations amount to conformal transformations in x space. So I'll just write it here, conformal. Uh, transformations x space. Of course, it's well known that n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory is an exact conformal field theory, but this is not the ordinary conformal symmetry in position space. Even though these have been given historically the somewhat confusing uh, name x, these are not position space variables. These are more naturally thought of as momentum space variables. Uh, so in a sense, this dual conformal symmetry is conformal symmetry in momentum space. So what this means is that it's convenient uh, to introduce a new a notation where we let A, B, C, D be the determinant of Z, A, Z, B, Z, C, Z, D. Okay, so you just take these four four component objects, put them together into a four by four matrix, and calculate the determinant, and that's what this notation will indicate. 
So under MEGL Ford transformation, these things will always transform uh, by an overall factor, namely the, de the, the determinant of that matrix. Now, these Zs themselves um, are only homogeneous coordinates on P3. So these must always appear um, in combinations like, uh, you know, I'm going to make up something here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H over A, B, G, H. Okay, so you can never have one of these things alone in any formula for a scattering amplitude because it, it's not, uh, it's, it's not a well-defined variable, keeping in mind that these are homogeneous coordinates and you need this to all be invariant under arbitrary projective transformations. So good variables are ratios of this type. So we'll encounter these things uh, throughout the, the rest of this lecture. And, and, and notice that, importantly, uh, if you were to do an arbitrary GL4 transformation on this so that you pull out a factor of the determinant, that will always cancel in these kinds of ratios. Okay. So the main thrust here, I just wanted to introduce some notation. Oh, oh, and before I go on, um, uh, at the end of this lecture, we're going to be doing some fun examples where we play games with solving equations involving these kinds of brackets. So it's important to get some kind of geometric intuition for them. So uh, if you go to a, a, a patch in, in projective space, it's essentially R3 plus some pieces at infinity. So you can think about you can geometrically think about these points in twister space as if they were points in R3. And that, then you can use some geometric intuition. So uh, the geometric intuition tells you that A, B, C, D is e equal to zero if and only if the points um, A, B, C, D lie in a plane. Okay, so if you, have, if you have any three generic points in, in R3, generically they will lie in a plane. Now if you add a fourth point, it's a non-trivial condition that all four of them lie in a plane. And you can think about this uh, as expressing that condition. Yes? It is, it is invertible for generic kinematics. These things might blow up, absolutely. So, so scattering amplitudes um, are supposed to be uh, complicated analytic functions that have poles and branch cuts. So we do expect scattering amplitudes to have singularities. Um, and the study and classification of those singularities is very important. But let's always, just for these lectures, assume we have generic kinematics. Um, or you can think about it, I mean, another way you can think about it if uh, the lines AB and CD intersect. So here I'm introducing uh, a new notation. I mean, it's implied in that sentence, but I'll, I'll state it here explicitly. Notation AB means the line uh, through the points A and B. Um, okay, so you can get a geometric intuition for what these brackets mean, and we'll be uh, exploiting that later on in today's lecture. So the uh, thing we want to play with are loop amplitudes. So uh, any loop amplitude, if we think about it in terms of Feynman diagrams, schematically, any L loop amplitude can be written as um, integral where in capital D space time dimensions.
over L loop momenta and then um, this thing is the sum of all L loop Feynman diagrams. Now again, we hope to never actually have to add up Feynman diagrams and compute them, but we know that they exist and we know that you could do this computation for any amplitude you're interested in. And if you did do that computation, you would add up all your Feynman diagrams and you would get something. And this is the thing we're interested in. This is what we call the integrand, or let me write the L loop integrand. And importantly, it is a rational function. And we know that just because uh, you can choose your Feynman rules to, to be manifestly rational functions. You can have various numerator factors that depend on momenta. That typically happens in gauge theory. And then you have propagators in the denominator. So it is a rational function of the external kinematic data. That would be P1 through Pn. And the loop momenta, L1 through LL. We're integrating over these loop momenta from minus infinity to infinity in all components. But in today's lecture, I mean, there's a huge body of mathematics about carrying out that integral. And we're not going to uh, have time to discuss any of that. What we're going to discuss today are the properties of this thing as a rational function and how to determine it easily. Absolutely not. And in general, it doesn't converge. All right, so, um, before, so I want to do one example in order to motivate how fantastic this momentum twister notation is. So often, often we like to compute integrands not by summing Feynman diagrams, but by guessing. So here I'll explain computing integrands by educated guessing. And uh, a more sophisticated and technically correct word would be called generalized unitarity. This is a, a method that has been uh, used for decades, especially by leading practitioners of the art like Bern Dixon and Kossover. Um, and we're just going to do an extremely simple example. So let's consider a one loop four particle amplitude. So here, okay, this gray blob. What it means is the sum of all one loop Feynman diagrams. Okay. Now, if you're in a complicated theory like n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory, that's, that can be a rather non trivial uh, sum. There will be several dozen uh, Feynman diagrams contributing to it, and each one will be quite a mess. Let's Guess, okay, this turns out to be true, but uh, let's imagine that um, this sum of Feynman diagrams, if you would literally add them all up, um, what if they somehow cancel and collapse into a single scalar integral? So let me, let me finish drawing this um, and then explain what I mean. 
means a constant to be determined. L, I'll need to define an L here. Okay, this picture stands for this Feynman integral. Okay, so if you literally translate this scalar Feynman integral um, as, a, as an integral over the loop momentum, that's what it means. Okay, so let me take a step back and explain the motivation of what's going on here. The, the, the poor man's version of the generalized unitarity method is simply to say, well, gosh, I really, I don't want to, I don't want to compute all these Feynman diagrams. Let me try to guess what they could possibly add up to, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to solve for this coefficient c. And if I get a solution, that's good. That doesn't prove that I'm correct, but, but, but maybe I'm on the right track. The basic idea is we know this, OK, let me be a little more sophisticated. We know this thing is a rational function. So what I can do is I can make some educated guesses about some relatively simple rational functions that might appear. I could make a list of them. I could take a linear combination of them and try to determine all the coefficients, okay? In this particular example, it's kind of trivial because we'll see that, in fact, you only need one single rational function. In a more complicated example that we'll do in a moment, you, you, you would have some more complicated amplitude here and you would make a guess, oh, well, there are six obvious rational functions I could think of that it might involve so let me try to guess that it's a rational function of those, a, a linear combination of those six, and then try to determine the coefficients somehow. And if you find a self-consistent solution, uh, you're, you're on a good track. If you find there's no solution, then your, your basis is not big enough, or what you thought was a basis was not actually a basis. So the basic, the basic idea here is we're going to probe these rational functions by looking at their singularities. So we'll probe this equation and compute C by, uh, by looking at the singularities of both sides as rational functions. Okay. So specifically, We'll integrate both sides over L. But instead of the physical contour, so if you were actually wanted to calculate the value of the scattering amplitude, you would integrate either side over loop momenta ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity with a particular I epsilon prescription that's absolutely crucial for getting the physics right, but I'm not gonna do that at all. I'm gonna integrate both sides over a completely different contour in the complex plane. I'll integrate over a closed contour uh, in the complex well, actually, it's in C4, because I'm going to treat each of the four components of L as an independent complex variable. And then instead of integrating over the physical contour, which is the one that goes mostly along the real axis in all of them, uh, I'll integrate over a closed contour around the locus where 
L squared equals um, L minus K1 squared equals L minus K1 minus K2 squared equals L plus K4 squared equals zero. Okay, in other words, basically, I want to compute a residue. Okay, it's just, it's a little fancier than a residue because it's four complex dimensional. Like, if I had two rational functions of a single complex variable z, and I told you, oh, I'm going to integrate both sides uh, over a little circle that goes around some point z naught in the complex plane. That, that's a fancy way of saying I'm going to compute the residue on both sides and compare them. Okay. Here I'm just doing essentially the same thing, but in higher complex dimension. Each of these is a rational, so the sum of all Feynman diagrams is some rational function of L. And this thing is a rational function of L. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the residue on both sides of this equation around the locus where these four are zero. Because I, I need four conditions to completely localize um, my loop integration variables to a point. Okay, so that's the logic here. Yes, yes, the locus will be, so let's determine what that point is. Um, yeah. So these, these four equations, actually it's two points. They're quadratic equations, so you get two solutions. These four equations have two solutions. Okay, and they are given by um, L1. That means the first solution. And L2 is the parity conjugate. OK, let's check that these are solutions. Um, OK. Uh, first of all, they have to satisfy L squared equals zero. They have to be null. Both of these are clearly null because I've manifestly written them in a form that's an outer product of two two-component objects. So the deter thinking about this as a two-by-two two matrix in A, A dot indices, yes, the determinant of this is zero. Check. Okay, so we've satisfied the first equation. Now let's look at the second equation, L minus K1. Well. Uh, and let's just look at this one for a moment. If we do this, um, that's obviously also null. Okay. So let's do L1 minus K1. This is 1, 2 over 4, 2. What I, I'm going to go ahead and factor this out. It's lambda 1, 1, 2 over 4, 2. Lambda 4 tilde minus lambda 1 tilde. Okay, this is also null. Because again, it factors into an outer product. Okay, there's nothing to check. Uh, this one is also obviously null. L, uh, and the same holds for L2, obviously. Um, L minus K4, sorry, L plus K4 is obviously also null for both L1 and L2. So the only non-trivial thing to check uh, is the last one. Let's check L1, uh, L, and I'll do the first solution. The solutions work essentially the same way. So this is 1, 2 over 4, 2, lambda 1, lambda 4, tilde, minus lambda 1, lambda 1, tilde, minus lambda 2, lambda 2, tilde. Okay. This is equal to lambda 1 
uh, 1, 2, lambda, 4, tilde, minus 4, 2, lambda, 1, tilde, minus 4, 2, lambda, 2, lambda, 2, tilde. I'm combining this all over the common denominator 4, 2. Now this piece here, you can simplify it. with what's called the Skouten identity. Skouten identity says that AB uh, lambda tilde C plus BC lambda tilde A plus CA lambda tilde B equals zero. This identity is true simply because the lambda tildes are, are two component objects. So if you have any three of them, they can't all be linearly independent. There has to be some linear relation between them. So if I've got lambda tilde A, lambda tilde B, and lambda tilde C, they can't all be linearly independent. There's a linear relation between them, and this is the linear relation between them. Okay, so you can simplify that with the Skouten identity, and this simply becomes 1, 4, lambda 1 minus 4, 2, lambda 2. Everything factors now over 4, 2. And this is again null, because here it's written in factored form. Okay, are there any questions about this? So, so I, I, I've hopefully convinced you that this and this are the two solutions um, of these four equations. They're complex conjugate solutions, um, or parity conjugate, it's the same thing. So remember that in general, we, we, we think of our lambdas and lambda tildes to be independent complex variables. So this is some, you know, th this is some point in loop momentum space that's in general nowhere near the physical integration contour. It's way off somewhere else, and this is at the complex conjugate point. But what we're going to do is compute the residue of that thing around each of these points separately. So first, let's compute uh, the residue of the right-hand side. This is a fairly simple calculation. It's one over, it's a multidimensional residue, so it's one over the determinant. Uh, if, I define, if I define F1 to be L squared, F2 to be L minus K1 squared, F3 to be L minus K1 minus K2 squared, and F4 to be L plus K4 squared, then this residue is one over the determinant of the partial derivative of fi with respect to dl mu. Okay, this is a four by four matrix. I runs from one to four. Mu, this runs over the four components of the loop momentum, zero, one, two, three. So you just compute that matrix of partial derivatives uh, as a four by four matrix, and then you evaluate it at the pole. It's a very simple exercise, and I'll just quote for you the answer. It's one over uh, K1 plus K2 squared, K3 plus K4 squared. Okay, uh, so that's the, oh, so the, um, so the residue on the right-hand side is going to be literally C times this. What about the residue on the left-hand side? 
Well, we did a similar calculation in my lecture earlier this morning. It's the same idea that goes into the residue calculation of the tree level BCFW relations. Left hand side, we have the residue one, two, three, four equals. Okay. Now, this gray blob means all possible one loop Feynman diagrams. There are many of them. Clearly, the only Feynman diagrams that are going to contribute to that residue are the ones that have four propagators of the form Oops. L, yeah, where was my L? L was pointing up here. Okay. Only Feynman diagrams with this topology, meaning only Feynman diagrams that have this propagator and that propagator, and that propagator, and that propagator. Only those can possibly contribute to the residue. So throw all the others away. They don't contribute. And so here, you literally get um, uh, pull this, again, anytime you have some, something non-singular, you can pull it right out of your residue. So when I draw this picture, okay, this picture means a product of four tree amplitudes. So when we did BACFW this morning and we calculated the residue, we got a product of two tree amplitudes, one on the left and one on the right. Okay, here we're doing a more complicated higher dimensional residue calculation, but the idea is the same. Uh, the residue of this is going to give this product of four tree amplitudes times the residue of the remaining propagators here. But that we've already computed as one over ST. Let me quickly assemble everything here. Uh, let's specify a definite uh, helicity configuration. For definiteness, let us Look at A, one loop, one minus, two minus, three plus, four plus. Okay, you could, you could make any choice you want. Um, so then we have um, there are two possible Felicity assignments. Okay. I also mentioned this uh, earlier today. Uh, here, I should really have a sum over, over helicities of the ex internal leg. Right, because if you look at all Feynman diagrams that have this topology of propagators, there are several possible contributions. You could have positive helicity there, negative helicity there, or the reverse. Um, so you have to allow all possible helicity configurations. So here, if we've got one minus, uh, yeah, we've got one minus, two minus, three plus, 
4 plus and we look at the possible helicity assignments. Now remember, the three particle amplitude is special, okay? There are two possible non-vanishing three particle amplitudes, plus, plus, minus, and plus, minus, minus. So there are only gonna be two uh, possible things that we can draw here. Uh, over here in the left-hand column, let's pick, uh, pick uh, uh, minus, minus, plus uh, for the, uh, well, let me, let me just draw it in here. Here we can do minus, plus. Let's pick, let's pick the case where this is negative helicity and that's positive helicity, okay? And then over here, we'll do the opposite. Over here, we'll do plus, minus. Okay, so these are the two possible diagrams and now you can fill in all the rest of the helicities because we know the only non-vanishing amplitudes. If this is minus minus, the only way to get a non-zero answer there is a plus. But if you have an outgoing plus here, that turns into an incoming minus. Here you have minus minus, so the only possibility is plus, minus. Um, here you have plus plus, so the only possibility is minus, plus, okay. And here you can play the same game. Ah, no, here it's a little bit more complicated because there's some ambiguity, right? Because here I could put plus or minus. Um, in general, you'd have to sum over um, all possibilities. But I happen to know the only one that gives a non-zero answer, so I'll just quickly. Uh... Okay, so. Okay, so the residue of the of left hand side is equal to this diagram plus this diagram evaluated at L1 or L2. Oh, sorry, times one over ST, yeah. But that's gonna cancel out of both sides of the equation. Um, okay. That's right. Yeah, good. Let me, let me, let me, let me, yes, thank you. That's a better way of saying it. So I have the one over ST on both sides of this equation. So now I've determined C. But uh, let's keep in mind, it's all of this evaluated um, at L equals L1 or L equals L2. Now here's the important point. Okay, there, there are two separate residues. We can do the calculations separately. No one tells us to add them. Um, at the pole L equals L1, and now I need to remind you what that was. Okay, um, at the pole L equals L1 equals this, let's look at, um, we have one corner that looks like this, one minus, minus, plus. Okay, where this is um, L, and this is L minus K1. Now let's remember our formula for the three level, uh, sorry, the tree level three point amplitude. It's the two negative helicity gluons in the numerator cubed. And then it's uh, L minus K1 L, L1. That was our formula for the three-point uh, three amplitude with two negative helicity gluons. But this is now zero. It's, 
it's zero because of this factor in the numerator that the, the inner product you see because the, the undotted index, this angle bracket denotes the, uh, I remind you, one comma L means epsilon AB, lambda one with LA, keeping the you know, other index untouched. If you will, so well that 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 I'm sorry that that's very poor notation, but the point is uh, L one is already equal to lambda one, so you get a zero. Okay, so similarly on L equals L two, the second diagram vanishes. The two non-vanishing diagrams, okay, are the same. So at uh, L equals L1, the second diagram evaluates to 1, 2 cubed over 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. So I won't do that exercise on the board for lack of time, but if you take this three-point amplitude times this three-point amplitude times this three-point amplitude times this three-point amplitude and evaluate it at the solution L equals L1, you'll see that it collapses to this. At L equals L2, the first diagram also evaluates to exactly the same thing. So all we can conclude now is that C equals 1, 2 cubed over 2, 3, 3, 1, uh, 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 4, 4, 1 is consistent. Okay, so let me take a step back and he, here we're trying to compare two different rational functions. We found that each rational function, I'm sorry, this rational function obviously has precisely two poles at L1 and L2. Then we computed the residue and on the residue of those two poles it, it takes the same value. Um, well, except for a crucial minus sign, which I'm really, I'm, I'm really suppressing the minus sign here, but it's important. Then I computed the residue of the left-hand side on those two poles, and I got the same value. Okay, had I gotten different values here, then this formula, there's no way it would have worked. There's no way that you can have one, f one f rational function that has different residues on two poles be equal to a rational function that has the same residues on two poles. So this, the conclusion is, unfortunately I still have this on the board, that this is equal to one two cubed over two three 3, 4, 4, 1, times this integral, so let me put a times sign, plus possibly terms with uh, zero residue at L equals L1 and L equals L2. Okay, all I've, 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 I'm comparing two rational functions and I've only checked two poles. The left hand side can have plenty of other poles because who, I mean, who knows what the Feynman diagrams look like. Now here I'm going to invoke a little bit of magic uh, that I'm, I'm actually not gonna prove at all. Um, these terms vanish 
in n equals four super Yang Mills theory, but are can be non-vanishing uh, in other other gauge theories, either with less supersymmetry, or you know with less and or less supersymmetry with various matter content or pure QCD, whatever. Okay. So now that I've done this kind of calculation the hard way, uh, yeah, so I, I definitely haven't proven that this is correct, but I've given you hopefully some indication as to how these kinds of calculations go and how we approach this kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the point, yeah, so, so, uh, Oh, but I'm talking about a one-loop amplitude. Oh, um, yeah, sure. So, 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 so this, the statement is that the sum of Feynman diagrams is, is a complicated rational function, but you can you know, move pieces around and regroup terms, and it's possible to express it just as this single one term. Okay, that's highly non-trivial. This was originally derived, uh, this formula was actually originally derived by Green and Schwartz decades ago by taking an alpha prime to zero limit of a one loop string amplitude. Um, but yeah, from the point of view of Feynman diagrams, it's not at all obvious that, that everything cancel, you know, you can have all kinds of crazy, uh, you know, you can have diagrams with triangles in them and all, all kinds of stuff. But the supersymmetry, one way to think about it is supersymmetry allows all that to cancel, leaving just this. But if you have a non-supersymmetric theory or even a less supersymmetric theory, those cancellations will be less exact. Ah, yeah, so you correctly noted that this thing here appearing is exactly the tree level amplitude. Um, yeah, that, is, that turns out to be a general feature for MHV amplitudes to all loop order. That, that uh, no, you could be at 27 loops or whatever, any, uh, and then you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't, if you were at 27 loops, you would not have a residue in C4. You would have a residue in C4 times 27, which is 112 and you calculate the residue, and you would always get the overall MHV amplitude times some pure scalar function. So, now that I've done this calculation the hard way, since I only have 10 minutes or so left, uh, that's plenty of time to do it the easy way. And I'll even do a more complicated example. I'll do a five-point example. Using momentum twister geometry. And it's here that we're going to appeal to intersections of lines and planes, et cetera. First of all, how to write loop integrals in momentum space. Um, well, let's look at that example again. Let's observe. So in that example, I had defined this leg to be L. A more symmetric way of writing that integral is to switch to these variables where uh, you associate the integration variable, not to one edge of your loop diagram, but to the face, okay? And when you do that, uh, let's see, let me be consistent here. Uh-huh, x2. Remember that momentum P2 is in my notation x2 minus x3. So notationally, this is indicated in this diagram. Uh, this is the nice thing about planar diagram that every, every edge is sandwiched between exactly two adjacent um, regions. 
So the momentum flowing along this edge is the difference between x2 and x3. That also works for the loop momenta. So this propagator here, this propagator is 1 over uh, L minus K1 minus K2 squared, or the same thing as 1 over X1 minus X3 squared, X minus X3 squared. How did I get that so quickly? Because this line is the boundary between regions marked by X and X3. So maybe except for an overall factor of 2 pi, this integral here is exactly the same as the integral over there. So now when we transform to twister space, or momentum twister space, we need to know what happens to this integral over d4x. And the answer is that you have to introduce two auxiliary points Momentum twister space. Okay. So the, what this means is that integral over points space time translates into integral over uh, lines in P3. That was our twister uh, correspondence that we talked about earlier. How do you specify a line in P3? Well, you can specify two points, DA and ZB, and specify that that means the line going between A and B. Now, that's redundant because if you give me any two points, A and B, I can slide either one of them along the line, and it still describes the same line. So, um, in other words, uh, if you take ZA and ZB and you multiply by any two by two matrix, you'll get new points ZA and Z prime that describe the same line. For any GL2 matrix. So we need to mod out by that symmetry, and that's what's indicated by this volume factor. Okay, anyway, so that's how you transform the measure into momentum twister space. I dwelled perhaps too long on that because I actually won't use the measure. I'm just interested in discussing rational functions. All right, so this is my, literally my last half page. Let's consider a five-point example. Okay. And I guess I mean gray blobs here. Let's calculate, uh, let's look for uh, the locations of singularities where these, where these four propagators are on shell. So the idea is exactly identical to the previous example we did, except now I have a five-point amplitude. And instead of using L, L minus K1, L minus K1 minus K2, and L plus K4 plus K5, we want to do this everything in momentum twister space. Momentum twister space, the propagators, are very simple. A, B, 1, 2 equals 0. This is the propagator A, B, 1, 2. How do I know that? Because this face here is the face 1, 2. This face, 
the X point corresponding to the space is the line in twister space between points one and two. This face is AB. That's my loop integration variable. So this line, this propagator goes on shell precisely when this line in twister space and this line in twister space intersect. So once again, putting this propagator on shell is, this, is saying that you demand this line and that line to intersect. When I do the others, So here are my four propagators, and I need to find all possible solutions. And I'm really in my last minute now, because I'm just going to write down the two solutions, and you'll see how simple it is. When I did this in momentum space, it was actually a little bit of an exercise to check that I was indeed satisfying all of my conditions. Here it's really simple. These equations have two solutions. Suppose here are my fi five points in twister space. Okay. Let's draw, let's draw the four lines, one, two, two, three, three, four, and five, one. And let me do two copies of this, because I'm, I'm going to claim there are two solutions. There's some inherent imprecision in the blackboard. OK. Now. Your goal is to, so, so the problem of finding a way to put all four propagators on shell transforms into momentum twister space as the problem of finding lines that intersect these four given lines. Well, here's an easy solution. Okay. Okay. The line 1, 3 clearly intersects those four other lines. So that's one of my solutions. There's a second, somewhat more subtle solution, which looks as follows. If you let the blue here be the plane one, two, five, and you yet let the yellow be the plane two, three, four. And I'm running out of colors, but if you let this be the intersection of those two planes, okay, then clearly, way over here, I'm sorry I ran out of space. But inevitably, there's going to be, well, they can be two different points um, where this intersection line intersects all those. So the second solution is the line 5, 1, 2 intersect 2, 3, 4. This notation means the intersection of that plane with that plane. Okay, so this was an example meant to indicate that solving these kinds of on-shell problems, these geometry problems where you need to put a collection of propagators on shell becomes completely trivial or relatively trivial. I mean, there are more complicated examples in momentum twister space. Um, and so you can use these kinds of methods. Uh, so let me just write the final formula product of 
four tree amplitudes uh, vanishes on one on the second solution, but not the first. We saw, sim we saw a similar phenomenon in our study of the four-point case. So this suggests that an appropriate uh, rational function to use in constructing the amplitude is, and here's my very, very last formula, you've got the propagators downstairs, and we need something upstairs in the numerator that will cancel one of those residues so it, doesn't dis so it doesn't appear. So we can explicitly put a factor like this in the denominator. That's a factor that vanishes when the line AB intersects that line. And then that's almost correct. There's a little bit more here that you can only guess because you need it to have the right scaling. 2451. This is required uh, to give correct projective scaling. And then we have this integral d4za, d4zb over vol gl2. Okay, so here with almost no work, um, we've computed the integrand for a five particle, uh, one loop um, amplitude. Um, and I haven't specified the helicities. There's one particular helicity assignment for which this is the correct answer, and there's another helicity assignment for which it's the conjugate answer. But anyway, um, just to conclude, I hope I've given you some flavor of how, how these momentum twister variables really help to expose a lot of the geometry of N equals four super Yang Mills theory. Most of the material in my first three lectures has been fairly generic to massless gauge theories, uh, but these tools that have been pushed really, really far um, are, are quite special uh, to N equals four, which is, has the most mathematical structure. Okay, so thank you for your attention.